Dr. Professor Glenty Martin, born on 22nd January 1944 in Rochester, United States of America, is a philosopher, a writer, a social reformer, and needless to say, a wonderful teacher. He currently is a professor of philosophy at Radford University in Virginia and the chairperson of the Radford University Program of Peace Studies. Other than that, he is also the president of International Philosophers for Peace, IPPNO, the Institute on World Problems, IOWP, the World Constitution and Parliament Association, WCPA, or Constitution Institute, the ECI. Needless to say, he has several international awards to his credit. He is the recipient of the ISISAR Global Peace Award in Kolkata, received in 2005, the World Peace Award, received from the Office of World Peace Envoy in Bangkok, Thailand in 2008, the Lighthouse of World Award from received from WCPA in Asia and Bharat Prakash Parisat in Chennai in, in India to, in 2011. And last but not the least, he, was al he has also won the prestigious Gassi International Prize, Peace Prize in Manila, Philippines in 2013. He has written extensively on his concepts and ideas elaborately in 14 books to his, which, which and some of and just mentioning some of them and the ideas uh, marked in some of these books are the global democracy and human self transcendence the power of the future of planetary transformation where he has spoken about the dynamics of self transcendence from both individual and humanity for the both individual and humanity as a whole together one and also the book of one world renaissance holistic planetary transformation through a global science contract in this masterpiece he speaks about why our predicament requires the creation of a global social contract that can only be adopted through a profound philosophic shift of holism and there are many other such illuminating books and articles to this regard. Therefore, I take, I seize and take this opportunity to warmly request this legendary speaker, this, our, our own guest, our, our sir, Martin sir, to take over and enlighten us this evening. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Sir, you are mute. Sir, you are mute, sir. Sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. Can you hear me? Now you are audible, sir. No. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I very much appreciate Kit University and its wonderful accomplishments and its it's a fantastic school of law that is concerned with the what in my view are really these fundamental issues of law the the, the question of a world law and so on uh, and not simply the details of local law uh, i've been asked to talk about the question of diversity uh, today in relationship to a government that might uh, impose uniformity on the world and uh, I think that's a very important topic, and I've written the paper that I, I, I'll, I'm about to read to you uh, on that topic. Um, so let let me uh, begin uh, with a, an overview of the paper. It contends that understanding the role of the Earth Constitution, right, the the Constitution for the Federation of Earth, in human affairs requires seeing it within the context of several principles concerning our human situation that have emerged since the early 20th century. Paradigm shift is going on as we all understand. These include the principles of unity and diversity, of holism, and of the nature of constitutional law itself. I hope to show that the Earth Constitution embodies the positive features of this paradigm shift uh, in human consciousness that can also function as a catalyst for further transformations that will solve our most basic human problems concerning war, justice, human rights, and the destruction of nature. So first part is called unity and diversity. Diversity can be understood in various ways. An atomistic concept of diversity deriving from early modern science 
takes the elements of a group to be autonomous components in external relationships with one another. The individual elements maintain their identity and autonomy, not through allowing the elements to interfere with that autonomy. Their posture is defensive and they are suspicious of encroachment. That, 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 for example, is true of many of the people in the United States. They have this sense of autonomy and they're suspicious of uh, encroachment of any sort. Uh, similarly, if, we, if there is a collective authority over the parts, the feeling is that this authority may limit the autonomy and individuality of the parts. And hence, such a collective authority is treated with suspicion as if it were a danger. However, although the atomistic concept of diversity continues to influence human thought worldwide, the conceptual revolution of the 20th century and all across the board in its sciences has revealed a more ontologically appropriate idea of diversity in which diversity cannot be separated from the unities that embrace it and constitute the respective elements as what they are. Each of us is constituted by the environment that embraces us. The fundamental paragraph in the preamble to the Earth Constitution affirms this principle of unity and diversity. The paragraph reads, conscious that humanity is one, despite the existence of diverse nations, races, creeds, ideologies and cultures, and that the principle of unity and diversity is the basis of a new age when war shall be outlawed and peace prevail, when the earth's total resources shall be used equitably for human welfare, and when basic human rights and responsibilities shall be shared by all without discrimination. Unity in diversity is conceived here as a single ethical principle. There is no diversity without unity. There is no true unity without diversity. And this is why there will there'll be a truly new age without war, injustice, or human rights violations. The atomistic concept of diversity described above believes that diversity is ontologically prior to holism, that the world is merely the sum of its parts. This can be understood through the concept of fragmentation. The world is a collection of fragments in external relations to one another. By contrast, the contemporary revolution in cosmological understanding that began with Max Planck and Albert Einstein in the early 20th century understands that parts cannot be separated from the wholes that embrace them and that make them what they are. All things are embraced by fields within ever greater fields, and there are no holes without parts, and all parts are what they are in virtue of the holes that embrace them. In that case, the diverse elements are in internal relationships with one another, not merely external relationships. The atomistic concept of diversity assumes that relations with other parts or elements are primarily external. What I do to you does not affect me. We are ontologically separate. The unity and diversity conception on the contrary holds that relations are internal. We are mutually part of one another. What I do to you does affect me. In Greek thought, for example, Socrates declared that it is better to suffer evil than to do it to others. Why would he say that? The reason is that when I do evil to others, it simultaneously harms me. Our relationship is internal, not external. In the 18th century European thought, Immanuel Kant in his essay on perpetual peace declares that a violation of rights in one part of the globe is felt around the world. Again, why should that be? In the Christian scriptures, Jesus evokes the ultimate holistic concept in which God is all in all. He declares, when you have done it unto one of the least of my, these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. What we do in the world is part of the whole. It, it affects the whole. We're integrally 
related to the whole. When, it, when this is understood as the Maha Upanishad declares, Vaishadaiva Kudambakam, all human beings are brothers and sisters, then it becomes clear that diversity is embraced and protected precisely through unity. Mahatma Gandhi states, if I found myself entirely absorbed in the service of community, he says, the reason behind it was my desire for self-realization. Self-realization and the service of the community are identical only because self and other mutually embrace and define one another. Perhaps this paradigm shift from atomism to holism of unity and diversity can be defined in terms of the successive generations of human rights. The 18th century developed the idea of personal rights and freedoms, freedom of speech, religion, assembly, property, personal autonomy. However, the world realized during the 19th century that these personal freedoms were useless without economic and social rights the right to a decent livelihood, to social security, to healthcare, to education. Individual rights do not and cannot exist apart from the social and community context that form a matrix inseparable from the flourishing of individuals. As philosopher Jürgen Habermas points out, a correctly understood theory of rights requires a politics of recognition that protects the integrity of the individual in the life context in which his or her identity is formed. The unity of our societal life context and the diversity of individuals establish an inseparable bond of unity and diversity. Nevertheless, the Weltgeist of the 20th and 21st centuries has expanded the scope of unity and diversity still further. Neither personal rights nor social economic rights make sense in a world that is devastated by the threats of nuclear war and climate collapse. Our so-called third generation rights include the rights of planetary peace and a protected planetary environment. These planetary rights recognize the holism of our human situation at a global scale. The diversity of cultures, religions, races, ideologies, and nations is embraced within a global framework that recognizes that all our wonderful diversity is meaningless if it's not embraced within a global framework. And that we cannot, unless we assimilate this deep holism of our human situation, realizing that we are all part of an ecosphere, all participants in a noosphere of mind on the earth, human mind on the earth, all members of a planetary community yet to be actualized. Without the actualized unity of our planetary community, the global fragmentation we now experience of cultures, religions, races, ideologies, economic relations, and nations is destructive of diversity precisely because what remains when organic unity is removed are merely power relations, the assumptions that relations are external and that your demise does not affect my flourishing. When are we going to realize what Mahatma Gandhi understood that not only are Hindus and Muslims brothers, but that their need, but the two of them, Hindus and Muslims, need one another. They both illuminate penetrating insights and profound awareness in relationship to the ground of being. They emerge together as part of human civilization. Not only are the USA and Russia brothers, but they are also complementary and necessary dimensions of our planetary human civiliz civilization. Rabindranath Tagore, certainly understood as much as did Sri Aurobindo and Swami Vivekananda. The Earth Constitution actualizes our planetary community of unity and diversity. Fragmentation destroys the ability to flourish of all the elements. Instead of celebrating its diversity and the beauty of Muslim and Hindu, India spends its time and wealth developing nuclear weapons. Instead of partnering with Russia and celebrating the profundity of the Russian spirit and culture, 
the USA commits another trillion dollars to upgrading its nuclear weapons systems. With the ratification of the Earth Constitution, we move humanity to a higher level of existence. We make ourselves more capable of living fully in relation to the divine ground of being. Diversity can never flourish and can never be protected unless it is embraced by the deeper level of being and wholeness that makes it what it is. Okay, the design of the Earth Constitution. Let's look at that briefly. Uh, the Earth Constitution reveals that the principle of unity and diversity is built into the structure of the emerging Earth Federation government from beginning to end. The World Parliament includes a House of Peoples with delegates from 1,000 electoral districts worldwide, roughly equal in population. The House of Nations includes delegates from all the nations of the world, and the Constitution does not prohibit the creation of more nations if we wish to recognize additional diversity among states. For example, a Kurdish state, a Palestinian state, an Ugar state. The third house in the World Parliament is the House of Councillors, 200 representatives chosen from 20 world electoral districts and again representing the diversity of humankind. No main agency established under the Earth Constitution is headed by one person. Every agency or department is required to have a presidium of five leaders, one from each continental division of the planet. Diversity is built into each agency and into the operative procedures of each agency, making the Earth Constitution truly representative of the whole of the planet. Because the Constitution addresses our fundamental planetary problems that are beyond the scope of nation states, and likewise, likewise beyond the scope of the UN and international law, it lays the foundation for a planetary flourishing of diversity. Its broad functions mandate the Earth Confederation to end war and disarm the nations, to protect, protect universal human rights, to regulate trade and reduce social inequality and injustice, to protect our planetary ecosystem, and to deal with all other problems that are beyond the scope of sovereign nations. If sovereignty, that is ultimate authority, is placed in militarized territorial nations, then it is impossible to accomplish any of these broad imperatives. The parts, the atoms, the fragments conceive of themselves as ultimate and their egoism fosters war, injustice, and lack of cooperation everywhere. The Earth Constitution rightly declares that the people of Earth are sovereign, thereby recognizing the holism of humanity that is necessary not only to protect diversity, but to effectively address the apparently insoluble problems generated by the incommensurable fragments. The Earth Constitution also places the global commons under the authority of the Earth Federation government, representing the people of Earth in their unity and diversity. The oceans, for example, belong to the people of Earth. This obviates the tragedy of the planetary commons, something I've written about uh, elsewhere, uh, and it makes possible the preservation of our planetary ecosphere with its oceans, its land masses, and its atmosphere. By contrast, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is a complete failure. Earth scientists with one voice proclaim that the oceans are dying in multiple ways, and there appears to be no way to prevent this under the present world system of fragmentation. Nuclear submarines on alert to initiate Armageddon slither beneath the oceans representing a nation state incommensurability that portends planetary death and destruction. This perilous situation is hardly respect for diversity. As the Bhagavad Gita declares, now I am death, the destroyer of worlds. In the face of our truly organic world of unities within diversity, such absolute fragmentation that denies these unities can only spell planetary death. 
The Constitution is a living document. Under Article 18, the Earth Federation government is required to hold constitutional review within 10 years of its first formation, and at least every 20 years subsequently. What the Constitution provides for the people of Earth is a decision-making authority that allows the Earth for Federation to effectively address global problems while uniting the Earth under a universal citizenship that it creates equality and recognition of dignity planet-wide. The Constitution embraces all viable UN agencies within its framework. Under the UN system that has existed for 75 years, there is no decision-making capacity, only precarious treaties, and only an ideal recognition of human dignity. Under the UN system, growth and progressive change are virtually impossible. World citizenship under the Constitution makes recognition of human rights university, universal and mandatory, no longer contingent on the whims of the fragmented nation states. As a living document unifying the people of Earth, the Constitution makes possible ever greater freedom of individual, cultural and national dignity and diversity. So the third section is I have here is on the philosophy of law. Early theorists in the philosophy of law, such as John Austin and Hans Kelsen understood law as deriving from the commands of a sovereign. They emphasized the power of lawmaking authority to legislate behavioral rules and use force to hold people accountable to obeying those rules. However, as philosophy of law developed and became more sophisticated, subsequent thinkers such as H.A.L. Hart, Lon Fuller, and John Finnis understood much, that much of law empowers and enables people in all sorts of lives to live in all sorts of ways to live thriving and fruitful lives. Moreover, as I have argued in a number of my previous works, Law is a civilizational phenomenon deriving from our universal human rationality that is intrinsic to our common humanity. For this reason, the law needs to be both universal and planetary. As pointed out above, it is only at the universal and planetary level that law can enable elected representatives of the people of Earth to effectively deal with a plethora of lethal global problems. In his analysis of the concept of community, John Finnis points out that human beings cannot become a complete, complete planetary community without the advent of world constitutional law. Similarly, philosopher Errol E. Harris concludes that no government of existing nation states is any longer legitimate because no government can serve the common good of its citizens. That common good is now global requiring the demilitarization of the nations and the protection of our planetary environment. That's something that can only happen on a world level. Both Finnis and Harris understand that the purpose of government is to serve the common good and that common good is now planetary, requiring a world community under the rule of a democratic constitution. A true community recognizes and supports the diversity of its constituents and promotes a, demo, uh, a common good framework that makes possible their flourishing and synergistic cooperation with one another. The second Bill of Rights in, in the Earth Constitution under Article 13.12 promises that the full force of the Earth Federation will assure each child the right to the full realization of his or her potential. Think of that, it's an astonishing statement to find in a constitution, right? Each child, the full realization of his or her potential. The realization of that potential includes both communal and civilizational dimensions, as well as personal and individual dimensions. As we have seen, these two phenomena are inseparable and arise together within our common human reality. The Constitution is not a Procrustean bed for standardization. It is a springboard for the realization of our higher human potential. 
Section four, there is no true diversity in a war system. The world that we know it is a war system. Major thinkers since the 17th century identified the system of sovereign nation states as a war system. In terms of social contract theory elaborated by Hobbes, Kant and others, the act of uniting under a single constitution is an act that establishes peace. Western thinkers regularly pointed out that a collection of militarized sovereign territorial entities recognizing no effective law above themselves is inherently a war system. War is immoral as Kant maintained. And there is really no such thing as a just war as I have maintained. Uh, a war, um, peace is a direct consequence of institutionalizing the unity and diversity of humanity. War presupposes incommensurable parts. Emery Reeves made the same book in his uh, same point in his book, The Anatomy of Peace, when he wrote, quote, War takes place whenever and wherever non-integrated social units of equal sovereignty come into contact. Reeves similarly declared that, quote, a picture of the world pieced together like a mosaic from its various national components is a picture that never and under no circumstances can have any relation to reality, unless we deny that such a thing as reality exists. The world is not a composite of 193 nations. It transcends that infinitely. The world is a unity in diversity. The, the picture of the world as a collection of nations is a false picture. It is here that we can realize once again that the Earth Constitution is not simply the imposition of more government upon the world, Analysis to the analogous to the fractured militarized governments that now colonize the territories of our planet. The Constitution transcends and transforms government to its true meaning. It ends the war system in the world, just as it ends the injustice system and the environmental destruction system. To establish the world as a peace system means to transform and transcend the very premises on which the current world is based. It is to recognize our human reality as Imago Dei, as Mahatma Gandhi, Swami Agnovich, Martin Luther King Jr., and many others have declared. Under the current planetary war system, many people mistakenly confuse their identity and its diversity with their sovereign militarized nation states. On every one of my six trips to Cuba, you you remember that Cuba has been under a blockade from the United States since its revolution in, 19, in 1960 and 61. Uh, every one of my six trips to Cuba, the Cuban people have said to me, we are a sovereign nation and the United States has no right to do these things to us. However, in a world of such sovereign nations, it is, precise, is precisely a world based on power relationships, not on right, not on justice, not on human brotherhood. In a world of power relationships, of course the US can do these things to Cuba. Just as India can build nuclear weapons in defense against the Pakistanis. Such fragmentation is not diversity, it is death for the diverse parts only flourish and live as branches of the whole tree. Unity and diversity are inseparable in the very nature of things. Establishing a holarchy, a healthy holarchy for the earth. Contemporary sciences understand nature as patterning itself through fractal formations that bring the smallest levels into progressively larger spheres of organic coordination from peripheries through ever greater trunk lines to organic holes. The human body, for example, made up of trillions of cells, tiny cells. These cells in a fractal relationship uh, coordinate together in larger and larger holes into organs and so on, and finally into the whole 
amazing thing that we inherit called our human body. The only phenomena that manifestly does not follow this patterning principle is human civilization. Human beings fragment themselves from the diverse communities around the planet that are constitutive of their very being. Rather than recognizing their mutual inseparability, they divide the world into vast accumulations of private wealth associated with barely 1% of the world's population, which owns 50% of the world's wealth. And they fragment themselves into 193 territorial fragments whose sovereignty is incommensurable with the sovereignty of each of the others. In nature, the patterning that takes place is known as fractal, right? There is an interconnected order from the smallest particles to the largest ecosystems. Well, world government under the constitution is designed as fractal, as a representation of the unity and diversity elaborated in parliamentary, judicial, administrative, and conflict resolution functions. Moreover, these patterns of democratic governance would repeat at ever smaller levels from the national to the regional to the local levels. At present, we have the chaos of a, of a pattern on the earth uh, that is yet to coordinate and unite all its parts. It is, if, it is as if the blood were trying to circulate without a whole living body to animate and enliven. When the holism of civilization is recognized and actualized, humanity will exist on a level closer to Sri Aurobindo's supermind rather than the current fragmented level, which I would call sub mind. For contemporary thinkers like Irvin Laszlo, the holistic pattern formation should be termed holarchy. Such a formation is fundamentally different from the hierarchies that have hitherto prevailed in human affairs. Hierarchies of wealth, gender, caste, racial hierarchies, nation state hierarchies. We, all, we need to abolish all such hierarchies in favor of unity and diversity. But this does not obviate the fact that the organic world moves through levels of interconnectedness from rel le relatively simple systems through intermediate levels linking below those below with those above with the higher level levels. This is precisely what the Earth Constitution does for humanity. What would it look like if we federated the earth into a holarchy from the lowest community levels to regional, national, to the global level? Such a, an emergent earth federation would represent the world-centric self-awareness of humanity. Human intelligence now representing the sovereign authority of the people of earth and reflecting the holism of humanity would effectively address the elimination of war protection of universal rights and the problems of, of establishing a sustainable world system. Section six, higher level of thought and being. To think that such a unifying constitution imposes monotonous uniformity upon humankind is to frame the constitution within the presuppositions of the current fragmented and broken world disorder. Our fundamental problems are global problems. Our fundamental problems arise from a fragmented, fragmented and irrational economic system called capitalism and a nation state system fragmenting the planet into 193 territorial fragments. Albert Camus, after the Second World War, said that under the world system as it existed, as it created that war, we are cut off from the future. We are unable to become who we are meant to be because we cling to a false ontology of fragmentation which does not preserve true diversity, but strangles it. A human being 
as we've seen, does not exist in independent of the species and the society from which we are born and within which we exist. As spirituality and law thinker Peter Gibbal says, law is to be a particular temporal embodiment of our effort at, as a real historical community to move from one, from the one to the other, between each other. Law must maintain, he says, its connection to justice by following an ethical intuition, anchoring the present to the future, an intuition of what we are in our being, but not yet in reality. There we are. We have an intuition of our immense human potential, what we are in our being, but the Earth Constitution will actualize that toward reality. Numerous thinkers like Albert Einstein and Carl Jung have remarked that uh, apparently intractable problems are not solved, but they're dissolved through moving to a higher level of thought and consciousness. When we see from the higher level, the, these problems vanish and their elements become integrated in a more transcend transcendent solution. That is the function of the Earth Constitution. The Constitution liberates us to move to a higher level of thought, action, and self-realization. It is both means and ends. And then my last paragraph here, I mentioned Teilhard de Chardin, right? He is so famous because he understood our evolutionary development on the earth as moving from the geosphere to the biosphere to the noosphere, the sphere of mind. The noosphere is the most recent encompassing level of mind that encircles our planet. Mind is everywhere on the earth. In every place it can be accessed through radios, through computers, through televisions, through our mobile phones. Turn it on and there is mind, there is organization, there is intelligent being manifested. But even so, our planet still lacks a brain, right? Mind, all the talk going on around the planet, but where is our planetary brain that can think about human beings in relationship to a transcendent future in self-realization of what we potentially are? It is not there. The Constitution for the Federation of Earth provides the Earth and humankind with that brain. It gives us the ability to plan our conscious evolution into a future that actualize our, actualizes our highest human, spiritual, and cognitive potential. May God bless this constitution, which enables our common human future. Thank you very much. I don't know if you're asking me. I'm not the yes, moderator. Sir, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm asking you, sir. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I guess so. It depends on how long it is. You Just know, one minute, whether sir. we one only minute, have 10 one minutes. minutes. One minute. Please. Please. So, uh, we are, when you're talking about the world law and the one law for the whole world, that is for the Constitution, I hope you already have provisions for enforcing those laws, right? And those enforcers have certain kind of power. Now, as Lord Atkins said, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Isn't it a possibility that uh, the five heads you had talked about previously about the executive and those who are enforcing the powers will have a natural bias towards their own nations, and these bias will be reflecting upon those, upon those nations when there will be a question of human rights violation or any kind of border dispute or, uh, let's say, economic dispute, any kind of those. In these cases, what will be the remedy of uh, the oppressed nations in, in this case? I mean, those nations who are not getting the favor. Um, in in my presentation, uh, I I uh, made the point that the Earth Constitution, the very adoption of the Earth Constitution and its principle of unity and diversity. Uh, would help raise human beings to a higher level, right? If, if, if we're all born, for example, uh, 
into a context in which, sure, I'm born in India, I'm born in China, I'm born in Russia, whatever, but we're also at the same time born into as world citizens. And we, we grow up in the consciousness of that. We, in our, in our schools, in our lives, in our development, we know that we're part of one world and world citizens, which is what the constitution would do for every human being on the planet, right? It, it, it would begin to transform that natural desire of people to promote their own uh, context from which they, they uh, arise. Secondly, uh, the Earth Constitution is very carefully designed to, to as, I was, as I was saying in my presentation, to, to maximize diversity. So there's, there's no head of state that, uh, or head of any one agency or any one organization. It's always a presidium of five, one from each continent. Right. And and uh, the Earth Constitution requires every person elected to governmental position or appointed to governmental position to take a pledge of service to humanity. Right. So what we're doing is the very process of actualizing the Earth Constitution is transforming this tendency that you are concerned with, this tendency of people to promote their own nation their own uh, uh, system through through their power uh, is is being mitigated, not only mitigated, but but transcended. So that uh, we're we're talking about, as uh, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, we're talking about giving the planet a brain, right? If uh, uh, of uh, bringing people into government, the governmental formation, which. Uh, 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 who are truly dedicated as to in a service to humanity and begin thinking as human beings for the future of humanity, right? And then, and then in addition to that, one more point, uh, the world ombudsman uh, defined in article 11 uh, is a, an entire agency of the government, which is worldwide, which will be dedicated to uh, being a watchdog on the government itself so that any any uh, uh, executive who falls into that trap of promoting their own interests or their own nation's interest or whatever their own races or religious interest uh, the the world ombudsman will be alert to those deviations those those possibilities and will 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 point it out in the name of the whole in the name of the common good of humanity. So I think with, with, with those qualifications, I think your concern is as serious as it might be in the present world context, it, it's precisely the constitution which is a, a attempting to help humanity transcend that concern and really create uh, something that is beyond uh, the uh, self-interest of individuals running the uh, earth country. Federation government. So uh, basically the purpose of the summary is that you're aiming for individuals to have the head, the political superiority, who has gained, who has considered themselves to be in the original position. And by the original position, I mean the position of John Rawls theory of justice, right? That they are unaware of their origin and they promote only what is good for human beings. Yeah, there we. I know lots of people personally, uh, who who are world citizens who are, who are in the service of humanity. It's it's not that common. Mahatma Gandhi was like that. Martin Luther King Jr. was like that. Rabindranath Tagore was like that. Right, Sri Aurobindo. Right. There's lots of in and this is something. There's a lot. There's quite a large literature on this today. There's uh, that it's something that's happening on a worldwide scale today. People are. In a way, there's a spiritual transformation going on right now with humanity, that with, where people are are moving beyond their ethnocentric identification with nations and so on, a religion, a race, uh, to to become truly global citizens, manifestations of our common humanity, and and that's what's going to happen. The the, the Earth Constitution facilitates that and empowers that, it helps make it happen. 
Thank you, sir. And my uh, second question is to Dr. Kanek Parameshwaran, sir, that uh, you have said that involvement of spirituality into the legal system, in the, in the into law, studies of law. Now, in this, uh, in India, we don't study law until the age of, say, 18, because of the integrated law. Now, if we are, will I be right if I say that uh, spirituality is uh, one of the modes of attaining a more higher moral conscience? conscience? Now, that the psychology and the social social psychology and human behavior says that our inherent moral moral conscience is already developed by the age of 18. So, if we introduce the idea of spirituality and idea of justice and moral conscience at the, at the age of 18, will it be will it not be ineffective? It will be better if we start the idea of start teaching spirituality at a very young age. Yes, uh, the in. Uh in much of current psychology, for example, in spiritual uh, leader, Ken Wilber in his works and so on, there are levels of development uh, from the egocentric level to the ethnocentric level, to the world centric level, to the uh, cosmic level. And in, in, in all of us are moving and can move collectively working together and through the recognition of world law, we, we're, we're, we're helping move ourselves and humanity into the world-centric and cosmic-centric levels. And, and, and these are the levels of consciousness that are going to transform our world. As, uh, as uh, my colleague was saying in his talk of spirituality, bringing the kingdom of God to earth. Right, so I think that your statement is excellent, very much on, on target. Thank you, sir. What is the jurisdiction and evidentiary rules of judiciary under the world constitution? Uh, the uh, article nine of the world constitution is, uh, constitutes the world judiciary. And it constitutes it in terms of uh, eight benches of the world Supreme Court system and the meth in the procedures by which judges are qualified and selected. Uh, the, the world, um, the uh, constitute this constitution and, and perhaps most constitutions uh, don't get into the details of the rules of evidentiary uh, um, uh, uh, juridical uh, workings. This is something that would come from world law itself. Uh, in other words, the world parliament, once constituted, uh, would be uh, developing that those kinds of rules. However, the provisional world parliament, which uh, is operating, has operated since 1982 under the authority of the Earth Constitution, the world, the provisional world parliament has developed. Uh, and passed uh, provisional world legislative acts, which identify rules of evidence, rules of procedure uh, with, with regard to any number of crimes. Uh, for example, the parliament took uh, the Rome statute of the International Criminal Court, which is quite excellent about uh, crimes of aggression, crimes of uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and, and has elaborated rules of evidence and procedure uh, and the, uh, the World Parliament adopted that almost verbatim, only adapted it to a court that has real authority, unlike the ICC, which does not have real authority in the world. Uh, the the world court system would have real authority. So we're developing, we're in the process of developing precisely what you're talking about. But ultimately, as I say, this is not the role of the constitution itself. It's the role of the legislature to develop uh, such rules. I hope, does that address your question, 